Welcome to another OpenStax Astronomy Lecture. Here we'll be looking at Chapter 18 and we'll be doing a Celestial Census. So when we look at the night sky, what exactly do we see? Uh, uh, we talked about classification of uh, stars. And so what exactly do we see? What type of stars are there? So uh, we did a survey going out about 21 light years from the sun. And uh, we classified all the different types of stars that we saw. So A type, there was two, F type one, G, K. And we see now that M type was by far the greatest, 94 of them. Uh, so white dwarfs and then brown dwarfs as well. But those M types were by far the greatest <clears throat> at about 94. Here's an uh, image. In the red circles are M-type stars that we had detected in the past. And in the blue circles are newly detected uh, M-type stars by the WISE Infrared Telescope here. And we see that there is a lot. There's an abundance of these M-type stars. So what can we learn from uh, these stars here? Now, a lot of them, these M-types, are going to be uh, very, very faint. So we have to have some other techniques to be able to detect some characteristics from it. Looking at our closest star, uh, Alpha Centauri, which is about 4.3 light years away, we see it some images at a distance. It looks just like a dot as a, a single star. But upon a closer observation, we see that Alpha Centauri is technically a triple star system. Uh, here, this image in the middle shows uh, two of the stars, Alpha Centauri A and uh, B. And so we see that, in fact, about half the stars, when you look at the night sky, are binary star systems. So two, maybe even three star systems uh, orbiting around each other. And from afar, it looks like a single dot, but we could see that uh, closer, uh, we see that there's two actual stars. And looking at binary star systems, we're able to detect quite a few characteristics from stars. So let's first look at the different types of binary star systems. There's visual, eclipsing, and then a spectropic binaries. Spectroscopic binary, I'm sorry. So let's look at visual uh, binary here. So a visual binary is one that we could actually detect visually. So through a telescope, uh, if we uh, monitor these stars, we'll be able to see them orbiting around each other. Now, this takes a lot of time, uh, depending on the stars, so, but through visual, we could actually see the rotations of them. An eclipsing binary is when one star will go in front of another, and we could detect a uh, short dimness in the apparent brightness. And this will happen periodically as it orbits around, so we know it's an orbit happening. And so we'll be able to detect the small dip and then the larger dip when the star goes, when the smaller star or the dim star goes behind the brighter star. And then we have a spectroscopic binary. And typically these, we don't really ever see the stars themselves. What we're looking is at the spectrum. And so we could see that uh, there's a Doppler shift happening with them. Uh, where the spectrum goes into the red uh, and then the blue shift. And so when that star is orbiting towards us and away from us, we'll be able to detect that small shift in the, in the spectrum, that Doppler shift. And so what's important for us is that if two objects are orbiting around each other, uh, they orbit around uh, the center of mass, so this uh, point, uh, imaginary point between them, which would be the, uh, that center of mass, 
and they orbit around there. And that's going to be dependent on their combined masses. So how far away they are from each other and their masses. So if we recall uh, Kepler's law of uh, or third law of planetary rotation, it gave a relationship between the period and the average separation. Well, Newton inserted this other portion to it. He modified that. And the key thing is that he inserted uh, this other portion that relies on the mass, the combined mass of the objects. So now mathematically, we could calculate some of these lower limits for the mass. And uh, what we see is if we plot mass in relationship to luminosity, we see there's an actual relationship between the two. So more mass of a star, the more luminosity it actually has. And in fact, all we need is two out of these three observations. So orbital period, orbital separation, and orbital velocity. If we could calculate two out of the three, then we could actually measure the mass of a star. And this is extremely helpful because we're unable to actually go to a star and, you know, figure out its actual mass. So being able to do this mathematically is an extremely valuable tool. Another thing that uh, we could detect here with binaries is uh, stellar diameters. So when one star goes in front of another in an eclipsing binary, we could see the dip in the light and we could see how long it actually takes for that to happen. And it gives us a good estimate on diameters of stars as well. So in summary, what do we have here? What are we able to see? Well, we're able to see luminosity uh, from stars. And we see that about 10 to the 6 uh, solar luminosities is on the high end. And on the lowest, 10 to the negative 4. We've also looked at the mass of stars. And we see that on the higher end, we're at about 100 solar masses. A few rare cases that are larger than 100. Uh, we think those are probably earlier generation stars. And on the lower end, it's 0.08 solar masses. Again, that's the cutoff for a brown dwarf, a felled star. And then we also see from last chapter is we uh, see the difference in temperatures. So ranging from about 50,000 degrees Kelvin down to about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So looking at the uh, spectrum and uh, with these binary stars, we're able now to detect some of these characteristics of stars. So here's kind of a summary. We see luminosity, temperature, and mass that are all related and when we look at the night sky and we do a census, we're able to get upper and lower limits. So these are the characteristics of stars, much like if we were looking at humans, some of the characteristics we might want to know is height, right? How, how, how tall could a human actually be? Weight, right? What's, uh, how large could a human actually be? Um, and so... These are the characters that define stars, that luminosity, temperature, and mass. And now we're able to have relationships uh, and be able to have clever ways of calculating these. So that leads us into the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung and Russell diagram. And what this is, is just a way of plotting the different characteristics of stars and we see that there's actual uh, relationships between them. So here we have the HR diagram. And so notice that in the x-axis we have surface temperature, but it goes low to high going on the left so over here you're gonna have a low and then we'll have 
high temperature. And then on the y-axis, going upwards, we have luminosity. And so just as a reference, we've plotted the sun here. It's one solar luminosity, and its surface temperature is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. So if we were to plot the sun, it would be right about there towards the center. So what happens when we plot uh, many stars? We start seeing that these uh, stars end up plotting from the top left to the bottom right, kind of on diagonal. And we call this the main sequence. So this kind of... This diagonal kind of spread here. So that's what we call the main sequence. And again, we see that the more luminous, the hotter the temperature, since the x-axis is reversed here. So top left, we're going to have high mass stars. And on the bottom right, we're going to have low mass stars. So this is another relationship here. Uh, so not only are we able to see surface temperature on the x-axis, luminosity on the y-axis, but on the diagonal, we're going to be able to now start talking about masses. So three different relationships here that we're able to see. High mass, have high luminosity, have high temperatures. So we see on the main sequence there, right, as we said, high mass, high luminosity. And we see that uh, those are going to be short-lived, large radius, and typically blue. Uh, low mass are going to be low luminosity, long-lived, smaller radiuses, and are going to be more reddish in color. And so we'll look at some of those uh, relationships here. So not only do we see now surface temperature on the x-axis, luminosity on the y-axis, on the diagonal, we look at mass. And now on this other diagonal going this way, we're going to look at size. So larger radius on the top right. And if we see some of these radiuses of some of these stars to kind of get a sense of scale, here's Betelgeuse. Uh, it's a giant in, the, uh, in Orion. And if we were to replace that star in our solar system, it would engulf the terrestrial planet, so be extremely larger than that. Aldebaran, another star there, uh, which should be still significantly larger, but within the orbit of Mercury. Here we have a sun and then a white dwarf, which is a corpse of a star. Uh, and typically they would probably be about the size of a planet, or roughly about Earth. And those will small radiuses we see tend to be on the bottom left. So again, going diagonal towards the top right, we would have a change in radiuses. So four different axes here going on uh, with relationship. So temperature, luminosity, mass, and then radius as well. So when we talk about the size of stars, we're going to have another classification here uh, with a Roman numeral. So one being supergiant, bright giant, giant, subgiant, and then five indicates they are on the main sequence. So our star, the sun, is a G2 star, if you recall, uh, 5,800 degrees Kelvin. That talks to us about the surface temperature, coloration, and then we put a Roman numeral of five behind it to indicate that it is in the main sequence. So our sun is a G2 five star. 
For example, Beetlejuice is an M21 star. So comparing the G25 and an M21, we see that Beetlejuice is larger because of the Roman numeral one, it's a super giant. But we could see that the sun is hotter since it is a G-type star versus an M-type star. And this relationship uh, will also give us now on the HR diagram is a lifespan. We see there's a relationship between the mass and the lifespan. So uh, something that has about 10 solar masses will live about um, uh, 10 million years. So burn out extremely faster. And something that only has about 0.1 solar mass will live about 100 billion years. So we see more massive stars will burn out faster. Kind of like uh, the more fuel you have, the faster it'll burn out. Uh, if you've ever been to a bonfire, if you throw a few pieces of wood in there, it'll last a long time, low mass stars. If you, uh, but you might have someone who's thrown in all the firewood at once, the pallet, and it all lights up instantly. So high mass stars but they burn out very quickly, right? That bonfire, you get a spectacular a light show, but it burns out extremely fast. So this is the complete HR diagram. And so to recap again, we are going to have temperatures on the x-axis, and this is reverse, where you're gonna have a low and then high, right and this is our temperature then we have a luminosity on the y-axis and that is again low and high so luminous then we have on the diagonal going from bottom left to top right that will tell us the radius so a uh, large radius on the top right low radius uh, on the bottom uh, left here and then we also have another diagonal on the main sequence here which uh, on this top end over here will be high mass but it's going to also be short life and over here we'll have low mass and I should say long life so we could see kind of four different axes going on here but five different relationships temperature luminosity size, mass, and then life expectancy as well. So here might be a good place to uh, pause the video, give yourself a quick uh, quiz here. So which star is a main sequence star? Which star is the hottest? Which star is the most luminous? And which star has the largest radius? So let's first talk about the main sequence. The main sequence is going to be this group of stars here on the diagonal. So we see that the main sequence star here will be D. Which star is the hottest? Well, if we're looking at temperature, we're going to only be looking at the x-axis here. And we see that an A is going to be furthest to the left of all of them. So that would be the hottest. And we see it's down here in the white dwarf, so it's perhaps a star that has just, uh, it's cooling off completely, so just has went through the end of its lifespan there. Which star is the most luminous? Well, luminous goes from bottom to top, so we're going to look at the star that is the highest. And it looks like C, perhaps, is going to be the highest here. 
and which star has the largest radius. Now radius goes on the diagonal, and so whichever star is furthest to the top right, and that would be star C. Okay. And then maybe we might want to ask, so which star has the largest mass? And if, and if you recall, mass will go towards the top left on the diagonal there. So largest mass would be B, which would then be the shortest lifespan. So right in that region is high mass, low um, uh, lifespan.